Jason Monroe had always been a rational man. Growing up in a small town in Maine, surrounded by pine trees and endless fields, he had little reason to believe in the supernatural. Ghosts, spirits, and demons were the things of movies and overactive imaginations, as far as he was concerned. But when he turned 17, one fateful night shattered his skepticism. Now, at 26, he's not just a believer. He's an author, a man whose entire life is dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of the paranormal. As a child, Jason lived a quiet, unremarkable life with his family. His father, Mark Monroe, was a hard-working accountant who took a job in New York City when Jason was 16, leaving his mother, Emily, to manage the household with Jason and his two younger siblings, Lily and Evan. The family lived in the town of Westport, a place so small it barely appeared on maps, but it had one infamous claim to fame, Pine Hill Road. Pine Hill Road was a local shortcut that cut through miles of dense forest. It connected the town's northern boundary with the highway leading to neighboring cities. By day, it was scenic with towering pine trees casting long shadows on the narrow road. But by night, the road was a place of whispers, a stretch of asphalt that had seen more than its share of accidents, disappearances, and chilling ghost stories. Jason had heard the tales about Pine Hill Road ever since he was a kid. Older kids would dare each other to drive down the road late at night, testing their courage. Some swore they had seen figures standing by the trees, or felt invisible hands touch their skin as they drove. There was even a rumor that a woman had been hit by a car there years ago, her scarf caught in the wheel of the vehicle as she was dragged down the road. Her ghost was said to wander the area, searching for her lost life. But Jason, being the pragmatic teenager he was, always scoffed at such nonsense. Ghosts don't exist, he'd say, with the kind of certainty only a 17-year-old could muster. It's just people trying to scare each other. But that changed one August night, just before the start of his senior year in high school. It had been a normal summer evening, with the air warm and thick with humidity. His mother had made dinner, and after a long day of running errands and helping with chores, the family settled into their usual evening routine. They ate together, and by 9.30, everyone had gone to bed. Jason's room was at the back of the house, where the only sounds were the rustling of leaves in the breeze and the occasional croak of frogs from the woods nearby. That night, Jason fell asleep easily, unaware of the terror that was about to unfold. It was around 2 a.m. when a loud banging startled him awake. Jason blinked in the darkness, trying to figure out what had pulled him from his sleep. The sound came again, a sharp, urgent pounding on the front door. He sat up in bed, his heart pounding. His first thought was that it might be a mistake. Maybe some drunk teenager, out for a laugh, had come to the wrong house. But as he swung his legs out of bed, he realized it wasn't stopping. The banging was insistent, growing louder with each passing second. Jason grabbed his phone and glanced at the screen. 2.05 a.m. Who in the world would be at their door at this hour? He tiptoed into the hallway, where he found his younger brother, Evan, standing in his pajamas, looking confused and scared. Jason, what's that noise? Evan whispered, his voice trembling. I don't know, Jason replied, glancing toward the living room. Stay here, I'll check it out. Their mother's bedroom door creaked open, and Emily Monroe stepped out, looking disoriented, her long brown hair in a tangle. Is someone at the door? she asked, rubbing her eyes. Yeah, Jason said. Stay with Evan. I'll see who it is. As he approached the door, the pounding continued, more frantic now, like whoever was outside was in a state of desperation. Jason's heart raced as he peered through the peephole. What he saw made his blood run cold. There, on the other side of the door, was his father, Mark, who wasn't supposed to be home. He had told them earlier in the week that he was working late at the office in New York and wouldn't be back until the weekend. But here he was, drenched in sweat, his clothes torn, and his face twisted with fear. His fist was raised, mid-pound, and Jason could see the wild look in his father's eyes. Dad? Jason muttered, bewildered. He unlocked the door and swung it open. Mark stumbled into the house, collapsing against Jason's shoulder. He was gasping for breath, his face pale as a ghost. His clothes, his usual work attire were ripped in several places, and there were deep scratches on his arms and neck, as if he'd been in a fight. His eyes were wide, bloodshot, and filled with panic. 
Dad, what happened? Jason cried, helping him to the couch. Emily rushed into the room, her face going white as she saw her husband's state. Mark, what on earth? I saw her, Mark wheezed, his voice barely a whisper. She, she was on the road. Pine Hill Road. Jason froze at the mention of the road's name. His mother knelt beside Mark, grabbing his hand. Mark who? What happened? Mark looked around wildly, as if expecting something, or someone, to appear in the room. I thought I could make it home, I thought. It was late, and I wanted to save time, so I took the shortcut. I took Pine Hill Road. Jason's stomach twisted. He had always told his father that the road was dangerous, especially at night. Not because of the ghost stories, but because it was poorly lit, full of sharp turns, and often empty after dark. Taking it was a risk in itself. I was riding home, and everything was fine. At first, Mark continued, his breathing shallow. But then I saw her. She was on the back of a motorcycle, sitting behind this guy. She was wearing a long dress, with a scarf fluttering in the wind. I, I thought her scarf was going to get caught in the bike's wheel, so I called out to warn them. Jason could hear his father's voice breaking as he recounted the story. But when she turned around, when she looked at me, Mark's voice trailed off, his eyes wide with horror. Her face, it wasn't right. She had no eyes, just empty sockets. And the man riding the bike, he glared at me, like he knew I had seen something I wasn't supposed to. Emily squeezed Mark's hand tightly, her own fear evident in her trembling fingers. Jason swallowed hard, trying to make sense of it. His father was a rational man, just like him. He didn't believe in ghosts or the supernatural. So why was he so terrified? I tried to ignore it, Mark said, his voice shaking. I thought it was just my imagination. I rode ahead, trying to put as much distance between me and them as I could. But then, my phone rang. It was my boss, so I pulled over to take the call. That's when I saw them again. The same motorcycle, but the woman, she wasn't on the back anymore. Jason's heart thudded in his chest. I asked the guy, where's the woman who was sitting behind you? Mark continued. And he looked at me like I was insane. What woman? He said. There's no one with me. Mark shuddered, his entire body trembling as if he could still feel the cold of that night. I got back on my bike, and I rode as fast as I could, but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was behind me, watching me, following me. Jason glanced at his mother, who was pale as a sheet. She had always been more open to the idea of ghosts, having grown up in a superstitious family. But this was different. This was Mark, the man who had always dismissed her beliefs, now shaking with terror. I was almost home, Mark said, his voice barely above a whisper now. I thought I was safe. But then, a car pulled up beside me. The driver rolled down his window and said, Hey, tell your girlfriend to be careful with her scarf, or she'll fall. Jason felt the hair on the back of his neck stand up. I didn't look back, Mark said, tears streaming down his face. I knew she was there. I could feel her on the bike with me. But I didn't dare look. I just sped up, but I lost control. The bike went one way, and I went the other. I hit the ground hard, but I could still see. I could see her, sitting on the bike, just watching me. Mark broke down into sobs, his body shaking uncontrollably. We need to call a priest, Emily said, her voice shaky but determined. We need to do something. This, this is real. Jason didn't know what to believe. His rational mind was at war with the fear gripping his heart. Was it possible that the stories about Pine Hill Road were true? Could his father really have encountered a ghost? The days that followed were filled with tension. Mark was admitted to the hospital, his condition worsening. The doctors couldn't explain his symptoms extreme fatigue, hallucinations, and a fever that wouldn't break. Emily insisted on bringing in a priest, but even after the house was blessed, Mark's condition didn't improve. Jason couldn't shake the feeling that something more sinister was at play. He began researching the history of Pine Hill Road, digging into old town records and newspaper archives. What he found was disturbing. Pine Hill Road had been the site of several accidents over the years, most of them fatal. In 1985, a woman named Margaret Turner had died there under mysterious circumstances. She had been riding on the back of her fiancé's motorcycle when her scarf got caught in the wheel, pulling her off the bike and dragging her along the road. She died instantly, and her fiancé disappeared shortly after, never to be seen again. Locals believed that Margaret's spirit haunted the road, 
seeking revenge for her untimely death. As Jason read through the old articles, he felt a chill run down his spine. Could it be possible that his father had encountered Margaret's ghost? And if so, what did she want? One night, unable to sleep, Jason found himself driving toward Pine Hill Road. He didn't know what he was looking for. Closure, perhaps, or answers. But as he turned onto the desolate road, his heart began to race. The trees loomed overhead, their branches casting eerie shadows on the asphalt. The road was completely empty, save for his own headlights cutting through the darkness. Jason gripped the steering wheel tightly, his knuckles white. He was nearing the spot where his father had crashed. He slowed down, scanning the road for any sign of anything. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he saw it. A motorcycle, parked on the side of the road. His heart leaped into his throat as he pulled over, his hands shaking. He got out of the car, stepping into the cool night air. The forest around him was eerily silent, save for the faint rustling of leaves in the breeze. He walked slowly toward the motorcycle, his breath coming in shallow gasps. There was no one on it, no rider, no passenger. But as he turned to leave, he felt it. The unmistakable sensation of someone watching him. He froze, his blood turning to ice. Slowly, he turned around, and there, sitting on the back of the motorcycle, was the woman. Her long scarf fluttered in the breeze, her empty eyes locked onto his. Jason didn't wait. He ran. He ran as fast as he could, back to his car, back to the safety of his home. He didn't look back. He never took Pine Hill Road again.